Whenever you have your eyes closed, there you are. And in a sense, that uh, opportunity for going inward, for making peace, being kind, being gentle and letting go, is there at any time. You don't even have to have your eyes closed, but it does help to at least let go of some part of this sensory world, the world of sight, visual impressions, which usually trigger memories or thoughts. It might be nice for you to see other people. If so, bring that joy inside. Get a sense of how it feels to sit here together. Whilst also appreciating the opportunity for solitude and being alone with your own experience. Something that we can't really put words to and that no one else can know. Only you can know your inner world and get familiar with that. So the first step in the practice is just to really listen in to your body and in particular to the sensations that you experience in the body and allow them to give you feedback to guide the body's natural intelligence as to how it wants to sit, how he or she or they want to sit. Not how you think it should be seated, but how your body feels right now and how you can respond with care. enough space between the limbs, the ankles and the shins, in the shoulder blades, between the fingers or even the palms, enough space in the spine and in the neck. really taking your seat on the earth and also allowing yourself to take up the space. You belong here, you're welcome here. This is your space, your time. So to start the meditation, I want to invite you, and this is only an invitation, to just begin with a little imagination, remembering a place or a situation where you felt a sense of quiet joy, contentment, well-being, maybe gratitude even uplift. It could be a beautiful park, even your own back garden or terrace, maybe sitting in a cafe with a good friend or reclining on the beach. Maybe just an unexpected moment where joy arose and filled the heart. And really bringing to mind that experience, that setting. Remembering how you felt at that time. And bringing it to life, sketching in the details, maybe the sound of the sea or the breeze. Was there a wind or sunshine? A particular smell? And notice if there was anything you can remember that gave rise to that feeling of joy or contentment. Perhaps something you were doing earlier or something you let go of. 
perhaps simply noticing what was already there, just by pausing, being still. Seeing how you feel in your body, in your mind right now, with this recollection. And if there's any experience of calm or joy, infusing your awareness with that feeling as you spread mindfulness throughout your body. Really taking your time to experience this body that works so hard for you every day. Noticing how you relate to whatever arises at the level of sensation, emotion, energy or thought. Mindfulness recognizes the experience without words. But between that mindfulness and the object of mindfulness, there you have a chance to put the right relationship. So in between the observer and the observed, see if you can add kindness, gentleness and making peace. This is where you make what my teacher calls the good meditation karma. The world goes its way according to causes. But you have a capacity to modify the effects by the way that you relate to everything you experience in body and in mind. I'm going to be quiet now and let you continue your meditation whichever way feels nourishing or helpful for you with just this gentle reminder to notice that relationship between the observer and the observed.
I'm just noticing if you encounter any experience that causes the mind to contract or recoil. And just gently soften around that experience. Maybe by spreading your attention from the center, if it's an experience of sensations, to include other parts of the body. Or even reconnecting with that sense of joy and well-being that you remember from your earlier recollection. Just getting a little bit of perspective, stepping back. and re-establishing a gentle, quiet mind. Real kindness, real gentleness doesn't attempt to change the experience. It's just to open that little bit more Allowing it to be there, understanding it as part of nature, part of life. Here to tell you something about the reality of experience. So we're coming close to the end of this meditation, keeping your mind, your awareness inside. Just notice how your body's feeling now, whether there's any change compared to when you began. how your body responded to the kind awareness. And also noticing your mind. 
perhaps there's been a slight slowing down of the inner chatter or agitation of the mind. Perhaps you tapped into some joy that was perhaps always there but you didn't really notice. Or just appreciation for being present. Putting things down for a short time. If you notice any peace, any pleasant sensation or joy in your mind, really appreciate it. Spend a little longer getting to know that feeling, however subtle. Maybe just some tingling in your fingertips or the gentle wave of one breath. before I ring the bell, just recognizing with appreciation this gift that you've given to yourself. Thanking yourself for allowing yourself this opportunity to meditate and slow down. I'll ring the bell three times and at the end of the third ring you can gently open your eyes but keeping connected to your body, to your mind and heart as you go back out into the world of sights, sounds. And before the third ring, just to say, you may continue if you wish. <laughs> I must admit, I didn't want to open my eyes today after Ajahn Brahm's meditation. So you don't have to open yours unless you wish to. Tonight will be, as I said, a little bit different from usual. One reason being that uh, I'll try and give a little shorter reflection, partly because it's been a busy day, and uh, yeah, partly because I, it just came to mind actually to talk about this theme when I was walking in the park. Because after such a sort of uh, rich and full program that we had today, and so much stimulation, you know, so many questions and dumber import, as well as all the technical kind of tricky bits. Um, I just really fancied some fresh air, and I've made a habit of going to this little local park. For the last few days, it's been um, beautiful sunny weather, really sort of idyllic situation. Sometimes England can feel like sort of heaven on earth in the springtime. 
And um, I was reflecting that the kind of joy that I get from nature is that very quiet joy that comes from the sense of being stilled. It's not really an agitated kind of joy. So even though there's some sensuality there in the sense of beautiful sights and colours and smells, blossoms and leaves flowing in the wind, it is the kind of calm, the kind of joy that leads to being able to develop meditation, I would say, and even learn about life. You know, you see the changing seasons and the different play of the light throughout the day. Nothing still in nature, yeah, although it's very quiet. And I also realise that the more I've been going to the park, the more I've been noticing about it. So I keep discovering all these little new areas. Like today I found an area which was full of um, old yew trees and some incredibly tall like cedar trees as well and um, a massive plane tree and these are all around the sort of outer perimeter it's only a small park but I was just aware that I'd never noticed that before and I realised that it's very similar with mindfulness when we start to tune up to the moment the present moment and start to see the joy and the delight in that we start to actually see more of things that were always there but we didn't notice. And it was similar with this path that I saw in the park. I'd never noticed that it goes through this different area and only a very tiny corner, but I found it quite captivating because my mind is, was open you know, and was receptive due to, I think, the simplicity of these times. And I've noticed also by uh, one of my little pet hobbies is to take lots of photos, as some of you will realise who follow me on Facebook. <laughs> and contrary to this popular belief that taking photos takes you out of the present, I actually find it brings me more fully into it by drawing me into the detail. You know, noticing all these little shapes and tiny little flowers in the grass or, you know, as I said, the changing light, the colours of the leaves... The copper oaks are incredible, copper beeches rather, are just incredible. They start off sort of a browny green colour on the underside and then the upper side as it hits the sun starts to turn sort of crimson almost and before going into like this deep mahogany colour. And you can really see the change day by day. And I've noticed that my photos are actually becoming more beautiful because I'm seeing more deeply into that beauty. And again, this is a sign that the mind is becoming clearer. You know, it's becoming less cluttered up with activity and mental chatter simply because of the situation I'm in right now and many of us are in right now in our lives. So, you know, the Buddha taught that contentment with little is actually a great blessing and I think this is one of the reasons why. I notice when there's less happening in the outside world I actually become a lot more grateful for what remains. And I think this can be the same in meditation. You know, if you start to notice... Um, the joy of actually simplifying the mind. So if, rather than finding faults with what's happening in the mind, you actually notice what you let go of. You know, the fact that you're a little bit calmer than you were when you started the practice, for example. Or just the fact that you've closed your eyes and no longer need to be concerned with the world of sights. Nor even really the world of sound. Of course, these impinge upon our practice, but... Sometimes we can learn to incline our mind to that peace and stillness and to that joy. And we start to see more and more of it. It's as though it starts to reveal itself to us because we actually have the space in our mind. The other thing, of course, that um, we were talking about earlier with the confidence, you know, confidence being a cause for joy. I was reflecting that in my life it was such a relief, especially in the beginning, to just realise that I landed upon these wonderful teachings of the Buddha and to really develop faith that this was indeed the path to peace, the path to joy. Yeah. And I think for some of us, if we encountered the teachings a long time ago, sometimes we lose track of that. You know, the path is in the beginning very inspired, you know, you're full of energy. Of course, I was also a lot younger at that time, twenty and now I'm forty-four. <laughs> And, uh, you know, that initial kind of golden glow can wear off after a while. But I just wanted to remind us all just how incredibly inc rare and miraculous almost it is that we have come in contact with this path and that we have teachings and teachers that are here to encourage us and to realise that not only can we do this, 
can we walk the path? We actually are walking the path. And I, I love this quote by Bhikkhu Bodhi. I've been quoting him quite a lot recently, but he says, there's only two things that are necessary to reach the goal of enlightenment, of full awakening. To start the path and to keep walking on it. Only these two things. And this is what we've done already. We've started the path and we're continuing to walk. I find it quite incredible that so many people have turned up this evening, even though you've been with me all day and many of you yesterday as well. And, you know, there's just this appetite that you have for the Dhamma, just for being around, you know, other people with a similar inclination. And we're sitting here together feeling connected, even though we've, many of us have never sat together in real life, you know. It's, it's really amazing, and I think there is a genuine sense of community developing. It's as though I am in your home, you are perhaps in my residence without even travelling. And so that when we meet, we'll already feel that familiarity, that sense of ease around each other, just through that shared inclination to practice. You know, and it's a funny thing with this path, because we often wonder, am I really going the right direction? Is, it really, is my practice deepening? But there's another really lovely simile that I like, which is that every little step, every little kind deed, every time you make a choice for living or performing an act of virtue rather than an act based on anger or desire, every time, every moment that you have this kind of wholesome mind state, you're putting a drop in a jar. And these jars are really huge, really tall, and you can't actually reach the top without sort of standing on a ladder and like reaching your arm over the top. You can't look inside to see how full that jar is. But what you can do is keep putting drop, drop, drop. And you know for sure that as long as there's no leaks in the jar, and the leaks come with things like breaking the sealer, I mean, breaking is one thing, but if you can pick yourself up and carry on, that's okay. I mean, it's natural to have a little leak, but you plug it up quickly, yeah? So there's no leaks, really, that are sort of chronic leaks. And drop by drop by drop, the jar's getting full. One day it will overflow, we just don't know when, but what we can know is we'll keep walking on this path. I really believe that once people begin, they don't lose it. You know, I've known people that have gone off for sometimes a few years and they seem to have forgotten the way or got, you know, caught up with the wrong people maybe and, you know, even lost some um, confidence in the practice. But they always come back to it because once you've heard these teachings, you can't forget them. You know, there's a taste of freedom there, there's something there that's giving you a sense of a different direction to go in, a direction that goes away from the world, away from the world of the senses, yeah? constantly trying to stimulate the senses and find pleasure and fulfilment there. The Buddha compared that to a dog going after a bone, but the bone is smeared with blood. It tastes like meat, it smells like meat, but it can never satisfy And it's a similar thing with essential pleasures, you know, it's not wrong in a moral sense, just as it's not wrong for a dog to lick the bone smeared with blood. But it's not lasting and it's not substantial enough to really fill you up. Yeah, so there's a different kind of joy. And the other one I wanted to mention, which is very obvious, which really stood out to me today, is just this joy of giving. I particularly want to shout out to my two co-hosts, Mel and Anne-Marie, Because many people may be here, you know, joining as participants in these uh, sessions. And you may even think, well, you know, it's kind of a lot of work to actually co-host, especially something that was such a big event. Why would people do that? You know, wouldn't they prefer, wouldn't they get more pleasure, more joy from just sitting in there like any other participant? And you might ask, you know, well, is it as pleasurable? Is it as joyful? And I think the answer may well be no, You know, there isn't so much obvious feeling of pleasure at the time. There may be some obstacles that come up, there may be some tension or frustration that comes up, but that's only at the level of sensations, that's only at the level of how you feel right now. But when you've actually, in a sense, given birth to something like a wonderful Dhamma event where people were were deeply moved, you know, by chanting the precepts together by renewing their aspiration to walk on the path, it leaves you with this very lasting, deeper sense of satisfaction and meaning in the heart. And it was lovely afterwards because we did a little debrief together and I was still feeling quite stressed in a sense by 
Um, I mean, I don't know if any of you realise that the technical difficulties this morning were basically that I was locked out of my computer and I couldn't even start the meeting. (laughs) So it was really quite stressful because my teacher was coming along and I knew that all of you were there in the waiting room, right? So at first I joined as a participant, um, but obviously that wouldn't work because I couldn't see anybody or I couldn't, like, unmute anybody. So that's why we had to cancel the meeting very briefly and get me back in again as, a, as the host when my computer started working. <laughs> but there was no guarantee that it would. And at that time, it was a time of tension. But you know when you go through these things and you persevere and it brings so much joy and so much goodness and blessing to people, there's really nothing like that sense of deep satisfaction. And I'm sure this is why Anne-Marie and Mel are still here. Correct me if I'm wrong at the end. But there's something there which is very close to letting go. And that's why giving is in a sense the whole thrust of the path. You know, the whole thrust of this path is not to get, not to acquire, not to attain, but to start letting go, giving, giving to others, giving to yourself, giving yourself the time to practice, giving yourself good friendship, giving yourself a good meal, giving things you don't need to others, giving to charity, you know, giving to the homeless, giving away, giving away all those like beliefs that constrict you. All the things that hold you back and tell you that you can't do this, you know, you're no good, you're not worthy. Giving that all away, even if that's scary. Sometimes we hold on to negative self-views because it's much more scary not to have a self-view at all. We'd rather have a negative one than not to know who we are. So we cling on to kind of past things or past situations that seem to define us and we don't want to let them go. You know, we don't want to grow, we don't dare to grow. And I think this is common, you know, because we're not familiar with how it feels to start tuning up with the joy of letting go. Perhaps some of us have been conditioned to think that that joy is somehow wrong, especially in spirituality. You know, what's this fluffy stuff about imagine you're somewhere nice under the sunshine on a deck chair? It just sounds so, what's the word, Pollyanna-ish? But actually there's something very deep there because you're remembering a different kind of happiness that's available to you. And you may notice that it's those times when you have let go of something that you feel most at peace. Times when busyness ends, time when work ends, even maybe conversation. Many of you might have remembered yourself at a time when you were in silence, I don't know. About the most enjoyment I ever get in life is just having a cup of tea with a friend. That's about as sensual as it gets as stimulating as it gets that's pretty big stuff for me go to a park, see beautiful trees and have a cup of really nice tea with a friend I mean I'm totally satiated in the sense realm anyway and that's enough, after that I want to just sit down and practice sit down and meditate another quality, I mean I could talk about many things but I wanted to talk a little bit about gratitude as well And again, not in an overly sort of religious way that we should all be thankful for everything we have because we've got more than others and we should then do a guilt trip. Nothing like that. But just to appreciate the very fact that we can be here tonight. You know, we've got safe homes. We've got internet connections. We've presumably had a meal. And if you haven't, that's because you're observing precepts. It's not because you can't have a meal because you don't have the money for a meal or there isn't food in the fridge. Just don't think about that food right now. That's impossible, right? Now I've said it. (laughs) Don't think about a white elephant. But you've let go of something, you know, and sometimes that feels a little bit difficult and maybe, you know, even slightly painful. But afterwards, like Ajahn Brahm said, you get a sense of confidence in yourself that these things are possible. And it seems small, but you're actually going against the stream there, the stream of craving and desire and just habitual tendencies to, you know, satiate yourself through... Filling your tummy, maybe overfilling your tummy, yeah. So just being grateful for whatever we do have. And one of the um, experiences I had last year really brought home a sense of how valuable my life actually is. And I'm not sure I really realised this before there was a threat to my life. And that happened just before the rains retreat last year. About three weeks before I was due to fly to Perth, I looked at a mole on my arm, which my mother had noticed a month earlier, had started, looked bigger than it used to be. But this mole had always been there all my life. So 
I just said, yeah, maybe it's a bit bigger, but it's the same sort of shape, you know. But I'll check it out when I get to Perth. And then one day my friend was with me, and uh, a very close friend, and we were on the train, and she also said, we'd been in India together, we'd been studying Pali, it was in 2001. And she said, I don't remember anything like that on your arm. And I said, really? It's always been there, she said, but not like that. And the next day I looked, and suddenly it was red and black and really weird and I knew something was wrong and uh, I was lucky to get to a skin doctor and they said yep it's a melanoma uh, which I knew at that point Um, and I remember having a whole weekend on my own in this um, vihara without any guest and just not able to do anything in terms of booking an appointment you know booking a consultation to have some surgery or anything and I just had to sit with that feeling that, you know, I don't know how far it sped. I really don't know. I had assumed that I was fairly healthy. I started some treatment for other chronic conditions. And this was the last thing I expected. And suddenly there was this combination, it was really interesting, of recognising how much I valued my life. Also having a sense of tangible, palpable fear from time to time, almost like causing through the body. It was like um, when you feel sort of tremors or sort of a fluttery feeling and it suddenly comes sort of from the feet right through. So feeling very ephemeral in a way, like almost like I'm not quite grounded, so it would just come like a rush. But then this would give rise to an incredible sense of love, like really so much loving kindness towards anybody and everybody perhaps because I was in touch with the fragility of life, including my life, and also this very deep sense of feeling that I had something valuable to live for. And of course that should be obvious, right, to anybody that I've got something valuable to live for, I found the Dhamma, you know, I'm starting this nuns project, etc. But sometimes it felt quite um, tiring, you know, a lot of admin, heaps and heaps of time on computers, which is not at all what I signed up for as a nun. (laughs) And I honestly did think in the past that if, you know, I had maybe a year or two to live, I would just go off and meditate. But what I realised when I was diagnosed with this melanoma was that no, I would meditate. I would give a lot of time to meditation, but I would also continue to invest in this project because it's something so valuable that I want to continue beyond my life. I want it to be something there for women and for the, the fourfold assembly, as we said earlier, the Buddha didn't talk about um, a fourfold sangha. He talked about a fourfold assembly, and he used the word sangha to refer to monks and nuns. I just want to point that out now, because it is quite important. What happens when you use the word sangha for lay people is that we don't notice that one of the limbs could be missing. We feel there is a sangha, so you don't know if that means there are monks and nuns or not, right? But when you call it a assembly or a community then when you refer to the Sangha, you know you're talking about monks and nuns. And there hasn't been a bhikkhuni Sangha for so long. There hasn't been an ordained lineage of women who we can take inspiration from, have as role models, you know, and and help to strengthen Buddhism as a whole for the longevity of the teachings into years and generations to come. So it really took me by surprise that I actually had this deep sense of valuing my life, deep sense of valuing the project and everything I was doing and it was extraordinary I had this word come into my mind one day and it just came in like I've had an exquisite life and it kind of took me by surprise because it's not the kind of word you'd normally uh, use for someone's life particularly but I think what I realised is I wouldn't change a thing you know I went to India at a young age and I found the Dhamma how far I can walk on that path is not within my hands but I can take steps and I've done my best according to the conditions that are available to me. I've done my best and I can keep on doing that. What is the to regret? You know, it's the same kind of joy that arises when you live a life of virtue, right? Performing good deeds. We're not only talking about virtue as an abstinence here. We're talking about virtue as the Buddha taught and that he made very clear is not only, for example, not to kill, but to protect life. He says, with rod and weapon laid aside, one abides compassionate and kindly towards all beings. So this is much, much bigger than simply not doing anything wrong. This is actively seeking to protect, to nurture, to safeguard life, yeah, to nourish life, to 
cherish it, to cherish each other, to look out for each other, because we're fragile, so we have to care for each other. Yeah, And you know how it feels to be cared for. It's really, uh, I mean, it's everything, isn't it? I often think food's a good way of caring for people, but even more than our physical needs, that emotional care is so important, that sense of belonging, sense of just being seen and recognised as a human being with the same sort of um, desires and aspirations as anybody else. This applies even to people who we think are doing very unskillful things in the world. You know, I don't really have to name names. We know who those people are. They're on the news all the time. But they also surprisingly do desire their happiness. They just don't know where to look. They don't know a way of looking that's different to the way they're taught, right? Or the way they've had it modelled to them. So they've lost touch with that inner possibility of joy. And you can see that in their eyes, you know. Some of these people look so deadened in a way and um, so kind of lost. So this kind of joy that I'm talking about is a different kind of inner joy, and it's not always easy to notice, but the Buddha talked about the joy that comes from living a virtuous life as anavajasukha, that means the blameless happiness. So it's not only an absence of unhappiness, it's actually a bliss, he calls it a blameless bliss, that comes from having a clear conscience, being able to go to sleep at night, you know, without regretting what you've done without thinking, gosh, how am I going to put it right? Or, you know, or maybe not thinking that way and just being numb to the fact that you've caused so much suffering to others. Mm. So this is really beautiful, and you can bring that up in your mind to develop joy further. The Buddha said, you know, it's good to frequently reflect on the way we've been giving to others or the virtue that we've performed. And it's not out of ego, it's quite the opposite. It's just to see that there are effects, there are consequences to our actions and that it feels good to give, it feels good. It feels freeing, it feels peaceful, it feels right. It acknowledges our interconnection, you know, our sister and brotherhood in terms of old age, sickness and death. So, and other things he also taught us to do was to reflect on the goodness of our companions, you know. And there's a classic example in the suttas of three monks. It's a shame it's not three nuns, because I always have to end up changing the gender just to bring the nuns into it. have to do it today as well, even, you know, even with the sangha that's <laughs> in Perth. Even when they support bikinis, they still keep deferring to monk, 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 monk. But anyway, three nuns can also live together in harmony and these three live together like milk and water mixed. And they used to think, why should I think only of what I need? Why don't I put that aside and do what these other venerables would wish? And they used to reflect about each other. What a great gain it is for me to live with such virtuous and noble companions in the spiritual life. What a great gain it is. They would consciously bring this up even in solitude bring up thoughts of loving-kindness towards their companions. And it's amazing if you do think about people with loving-kindness, in private as well as you know when you're actually speaking to them, then you notice that you're conditioning your mind so that when you meet that person, you actually have a more positive, a more loving perception, a more caring disposition toward them. Try it out, it's really good. You can just do it privately. No one has to know, but they'll feel it, because you're purifying your mind from ill will. So that's in a way about sympathetic joy and it's not very um, commonly taught, it's about mudita, but it's not only reflecting on other people's happiness and success, it's also other people's qualities and even, as all the Brahma Viharas, reflecting on our own goodness, our own happiness, our own success, reflecting on the fact that life has brought you here, right? Maybe we wouldn't be here if it weren't for the coronavirus right now, and that is, of course, something we'd never wish upon the globe, upon each other, upon anybody. Any kind of disease is suffering, right? But there are also positives to come out of it, and we're here because of that, partly. And isn't it wonderful that we've got the opportunity, the facilities, the inclination to make use of that to deepen ourselves in the Dhamma? So it really shouldn't be taken for granted. And I think my encouragement is just for you to notice, you know, the goodness of your life, the joy that is available to you, even with the simple things, even with the, just the peace or listening to some birds outside, going to stand by those great big ancient trees and just lean your body into them and let them take some of that tension away. 
you know, whatever it is. And let I mean, I always overestimate how much time there is in the sense that I've finished only about a fifth of what I wanted to say because I didn't even get on to joy in meditation. But all these cultivations that we can do in daily life are all the preparation and the foundation for what comes next because it's all about your attitudes, your, the way you relate to life and to the world. And the more you... Um, generate thoughts and intentions of loving kindness, compassion, letting go, making peace, thoughts that lead to happiness and joy, the more likely it is that those will keep on arising and actually shape your mind, your brain, you know, even at the neurological level, and influence your meditation. So that when you do see a breath in your mind, you can really appreciate its subtlety, its beauty, and allow it to satisfy your mind. Yeah, so that's uh, maybe a strange place to stop, but it's certainly time for me to stop because I do want to invite you to a new activity now.